last talk of the entire week. So I know you're tired, and uh, so let's get to the point. And uh, oops, let's play somehow. Uh, so I'm going to follow uh, Joel's talk on Agora, and I'm here for the Agora workshop. Uh, those of you who stayed until tomorrow, it's not end yet. So I will show some of our efforts on the isolated gas gas simulations that we're going to discuss tomorrow, and then zoom simulations. And then if I have time, I'll show you some efforts, uh, related efforts on the Subaru PFS project. Okay. So let's look at the isolated disk galaxies that we're going to look at tomorrow. And uh, for uh, Gazet 3 simulations that we've been doing at Osaka, uh, one of the new things that we implemented is the uh, new treatment for the Supernova 2, 1A, HB star contribution separately uh, using this uh, so-called CELIB chemical package by Saito. And this allows us to uh, treat uh, different elements, for example, uh, like these guys, uh, as a function of time, uh, uh, different element masses injected into the ISM as a feedback. Also, two, uh, type 2, 1A, AGB contributes differently as a function of time. It inputs in, uh, different amounts of energy into the ISM. So these uh, uh, different, ke different chemistry and uh, uh, energy is uh, now treated as a function of time as well. So we have different time bins uh, to inject energy and mass. So here's a, a different uh, variations of models uh, that can uh, cause uh, uh, differences in the enrichment and the temperature distribution. So top is the gas distribution, the middle is the metallicity, and the bottom is the temperature. Okay? So for example, if you don't have any feedback, uh, we, we know that the disk will become too crump, crumpy and uh, uh, fragmented, okay? and the very thin disk to form too much, too much stars. Um, if you have a cooling on in these models of uh, uh, blast wave models, you actually also have too much uh, condensing gas into the central disk and too much enrichment goes on. Um, for example, these two models over here are the uh, um, uh, uh, Dallavecchia and Shire 2012 model like uh, uh, type, uh, models. And then this is a thermal, thermal uh, bomb and then this is the constant wind models. They also have uh, too much enrichment going on in the, in the, uh, above, below, above and below the disk. Um, very hot uh, ISM above and below the disk. So the other uh, three remaining models over here, and these two columns are the, uh, the Stinson type blast wave models with different energy injection in the thermal and the kinetic component. So this is a 100% kinetic component, 100% uh, thermal, and there's some division between the two phases. Okay. So we are taking uh, uh, this, one, this particular model as our fiducial case, and then we're looking at other properties. So we first, uh, for example, checked uh, stock energy histories. Uh, the top three models that I showed earlier doesn't suppress the stock emission very much. Uh, for example, if you don't have any feedback, there's a, a strong overproduction of stars. Uh, the two stochastic models are over here. Okay? Uh, also overproduce the stars. And then the other three models are actually able to suppress nicely. And the requirement from the GORA uh, collaboration was that they have stock emission rate at one billion year, about one solar mass per year. And then also uh, stellar mass of 10 to the 9 solar mass at uh, 1 billion years. So our models satisfy those criteria, and that's how uh, the uh, calibration uh, went. Okay. So here's a phase diagram of those different uh, vari varying models, and you see some differences. If you have no feedback, you don't have any of the hot components, the gas simply stays on this 10 to the 4 Kelvin branch, and it does cool all the way uh, thanks to the Graco cooling package. Okay. Um, if you have the cooling on, you get the similar results, except that there's a lot of gas sitting on, on this branch, which doesn't participate in star formation in that case. So these are the ones that's uh, uh, um, also not producing hot and cold gas. Uh, if you look at these the stochastic injection of gas, uh, 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 energy into the uh, hot, hot component, you see these gases kicked up and they go over to the low density side. You see this very hot uh, uh, um, halo above, above and below the disk. Uh, the other variation of the models that we have is that uh, uh, these blast wave models, the gas is kicked up over here, and it will eventually go to here. But we don't have enough resolution to achieve that uh, bubble expansion, which drives the gas over to the low density side. So the gas is still remaining over in this uh, uh, really dense spot. Okay. So these are different variations of the phase models, uh, phase diagrams, and it might be useful for other code uh, groups to look at these similar phase diagrams and see where we land on. Okay, so uh, 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 Keller and Wasley show nicely that uh, these gas will go over here and then they will cool down here and then uh, eventually will go settle down to the halo. So these gas over here might be a little bit unphysical, being at high density and this high temperature. 
but I think we just don't have enough resolution over here right now. Okay, so radio profiles of the gas. Uh, the gas should be as gas density profiles as a function of dis distance from the center. Okay, these are observed range, and some of, uh, these fiducial models lie nicely along this line. Uh, stellar density distribution profiles, uh, self-formation rate profiles, metallicity profiles. Okay. More or less, so, uh, so these models that we use now is uh, within the observed range. Okay, so let's go on to the zoom case. Uh, here's a, uh, our, our fiducial case with the graphical version 3 with the metallicity as we agreed on. And we've been doing level 10, level 11 simulations. And the uh, final goal is level 12 simulation uh, in this collaboration. But today I will show you the level 11 cases that we finished all the way down to z equals 0. Okay. So here are the parameters. Uh, eventually we have to achieve this. But uh, this is 11, level 11 case um, with these mass resolution. Uh, softening for the gravity is one kiloparsec co-moving, and uh, we allow baryons to go down to one tenth of that, so 100 parsec for gas. 80 parsec is the nominal uh, resolution that we agreed on, and these self-formation thresholds and efficiency of this number. Okay, so uh, here's the, here are the movies of this level 11 run. Here's dark matter distribution, the gas, and the stars. Okay, lots of uh, uh, fragment. I mean the substructures over here. You see, and then the gas also has lots of clumps and merging into this uh, central galaxy. I think this particular mer merging case is the one that has one or two major mergers into the central halo, but not too many uh, violent mergers. Okay. So let me show you the, the gas in more detail. Here's the gas uh, at this density this projection. Okay. Uh, the, one of the major mergers happened around redshift 2, and that was that one. And then there's be another one major merger around redshift 0.5 or so. Lots of tidal tails, you see. There's actually a very interesting merger that took place over here where the two, two galaxies came on like this and merged. There's gas distribution. So everybody should get something like this. Okay. Um, let's look at the temperature, which shows the feedback effects more prominently. The gas gets really, really hot around ratio 3 to 4, and you saw the filament all flows flowing in, but by the time we reach below z equal 2, the gas gets really hot, uh, up, up to 10 to the 6 Kelvin, and it's uh, surrounded by this hot halo. You have lots of uh, uh, cold uh, dwarf galaxies falling into the central part, and continues to uh, provide cold gas into the central galaxy, which allows them to form stars. Okay. Let's say one more time. Initially, there's the cold filament there, but there's uh, other cold filaments down to z equal 3, but after z equal 3, the cold mode disappears, and the gas becomes really, really hot in the central part. Okay, that's the second measure. Okay, so that's the gas to temperature. Okay. And then let's look at the metallicity. Here's the metallicity evolution. And the yellow part is roughly the uh, t uh, roughly solar metallicity. You notice that uh, as those uh, uh, violent merger takes place, uh, the enrichment occurs within zero halo, and then eventually uh, larger and larger uh, area will become yellow, and uh, so we're getting closer to the solar metallicity. And at z equals zero, there are a lot of still dwarf galaxies unenriched. The middle pole uh, gas is still remaining in those dwarf galaxies, and they're providing uh, a low metallicity gas into the central galaxy. Okay. Here comes the second uh, major merger, and that will provide a lot of uh, metal rich gas into the central part. Okay. But the star formation continues, and it, it gets enriched to solar metallicity at the very end. Okay. So the stuff measure history looks like this, from high Z to low Z, uh, depending on resolution. Uh, we, we haven't completely suppressed the stuff mission, yet, so it has not completely converged. But level 11 gives you a stuff mission rate up to 20 solar masses per year or so, a redshift uh, uh, around 3 or 4. And then after this, there will be a two violent mergers, one violent merger at z equal 2, and another merger at z equal 0.5 or so. So I think when people, other people, other group also look at this uh, uh, level 12 run, you will probably get some, see something similar, stuff in history like this. Okay. 
And this, the stellar to halo mass ratios, uh, at z equals zero, those zoom runs uh, uh, agree relatively well with the uh, uh, abundance matching results that we saw earlier this week. Um, but as you go to higher and higher redshift, okay, uh, this uh, uh, low mass dwarf galaxy starts to have fairly high stellar mass. So therefore, uh, comparing to the uh, Peter Beruzzi's latest uh, result, uh, it seems that the stellar mass is a little bit high compared to this uh, observed uh, relationship over here. So this, will, this remains to be seen, and I'm not sure if we need to tweak our models even further or not. Okay, so those are the uh, uh, um, initial sets of results. And finally, the satellite galaxy counts in these zoom runs. And um, the uh, level 11 run actually has slightly higher count of uh, uh, satellites uh, compared to the currently observed uh, Milky Way number of satellites over here in the blue line. And then these dashed lines are the allowed regions of the uh, uncertainty due to the faint end of the dwarf galaxy. And this, uh, uh, our current model level 11 run has a slightly large number of satellites above uh, 10 to the 6 or so, so, so solar masses uh, in the substructure galaxies. But at the very low mass and cumulative count do agree uh, within the allowed range of the number of counts. So this, uh, we'll, see how, we'll see what the level 12 run will say. Uh, uh, if we overproduce even further, then it might become a problem. Okay. All right, so in the remaining couple of minutes, I'll show you some results for the Subaru. And uh, those are the nice results from the Agora uh, uh, simulations. But uh, in order to really compare these observations, we have to do uh, something closer to the observation. And one of that is uh, IGN tomography, which will give us uh, distribution of gas and galaxies and metals. So uh, one of the science cases uh, that the PFS is going to do in a few years is that, that it's going to produce this H1 3D map as a function of redshift uh, re with between route redshift 2 to 3 or so. And KG Lee has already demonstrated with using Keck uh, star, star formation galaxy data that you can actually produce this three-dimensional map of H1. Okay. So you can also search proto-clusters uh, taking advantage of large field of the Subaru telescope. Uh, using H1 distribution, you can search for proto clusters. And then once you have this distribution, you can compare the uh, galaxy positions and H1 distribution, and then also cross correlate with the metals, which will hopefully give us hints about the uh, enrichment of the uh, uh, from the galaxies. Okay? So to, in order to compare to these uh, uh, observations, we have to do larger scale cosmological runs, not just those zoom runs, because uh, it will have to have a longer la uh, path length of the uh, uh, line of sight. So we're also doing 15 megaparsec, 100 megaparsec uh, uh, volume simulations with these uh, particle numbers, uh, with different models to look at the differences in the feedback uh, results. Okay. So we, we, what we do is to produce these light cone outputs. Uh, so we have to produce a light cone from z equal 2 to 3. You have to connect all these boxes to produce the line of sight data. And then you, you compute the transmission curves or line of a forest. And then uh, taking into account the peculiar velocities of the gas. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to produce a proper redshift, uh, uh, redshifting of these lines. So there'll be a little bit slightly offset from these density peaks. And we also want to cross correlate this with the metal distribution as well. OK, so uh, first thing we checked was to look for like a flux PDF uh, that many people have already worked on since 90s. And then uh, there are new uh, data sets on the one dimensional a path spectrum, for example, on lambda alpha from SDSF's boss. Uh, so uh, we, we nicely agree on the, with those data points over here on larger scales. But there are some differences, slight differences on the smaller scales, which may be due to the number of details, for example, like the bin, bin sizes and the small scale physics that we take. But up to the scale of about uh, gal galactic scale, we are nicely agree with, agree with those, those data points. OK, so and then. We also calculate the galaxy H1 absorber cross-correlation. Uh, so you have a galaxy in the simulation and also absorbers. We uh, cross-correlate those two populations and see what kind of uh, uh, strength you can get. And then uh, you see that the uh, higher the column density is, uh, of course, you're more closely cro correlated with the galaxies. And then if you go to lower column density object, uh, you have less. And then uh, if you have very w uh, low equivalent width uh, absorbers, you, you might even be anti-correlated with those massive galaxies because they're distributed uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the field region. Okay, so these can be tested with uh, uh, upcoming data. 
uh, of galaxy positions and, and H1 absorber positions. Okay? And then, uh, together with the metal absorption lines that uh, Cameron has talked about, we are also using a Trident package to, to produce the metal absorption lines. And that, according to Cameron, which makes uh, our group also awesome, because he's uh, uh, pro providing the uh, awesome package of Trident. Um, so, so the, but, but currently what we're finding is that uh, uh, given the uh, uh, um, spectral resolution of about three angstrom of PFS, we are not seeing very fine absor absorption lines, but we only see this if you have very, very dense regions, uh, you have hot bubbles coming out, and then those regions might produce these C4 uh, uh, silicon-4 doublets, and then uh, you can cross-collate these regions with other H1 absorbers. So if you do that, uh, preliminary results do suggest that they, we can get some cross-correlation signals uh, within the female apostic region from the galaxy. So for example, if you have these columns on these uh, carbon-4, silicon-4, for example, you do get a stronger cross-correlation signals over the H1 uh, cross-correlation. So maybe we can see these signals with the PFS and uh, uh, probe uh, how these metals come out from the galaxies and enrich IgM. You can also do two-dimensional uh, two cor correlations, uh, transverse correlation versus the uh, line of sight uh, correlation. And you can see for the hints of a finger of God effect, for example, which could tell us about the dynamics of the gas around the galaxy. Well, and also there's a redshift effect. Uh, as you go to high Z to low Z, uh, more uh, 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 cor correlation signals uh, between the galaxies and the galaxy. Okay? So these are the, some of the hints that we may be able to prove with the uh, upcoming survey. Okay. And another, one more uh, direct uh, uh, correlation between galaxy and the gas is to look for the mean flux contrast and the impact parameter of the galaxy. So uh, it, this is the, the mean flux contrast, which tells us about the absorption strength, the stronger uh, uh, absorption versus the weaker uh, uh, absorption. And as a function of impact parameter, there's already data uh, that Jason already, ex has already looked at. And these are data points from his survey. And on the large scales, uh, we agree very nicely with these data points uh, from these two groups. On small scales, there are some differences. Okay? So uh, uh, we actually have looked at what kind of physical effects may cause these variations. Uh, search range, uh, how long past you actually look for these correlations can cause these variations in this signal. Or the redshift also has uh, uh, impact on this uh, selection effect. And galaxy mass, depending on which galaxy mass you cor correlate with, uh, that also produces different strength of absorption near the galaxy, which is directly telling us how much H1 gas there is near the galaxy. Uh, feedback effects also cause variations. So in the actual observations, all of these are com uh, coupled together in a very complicated, complicated way to produce those variations in a central part. But that all happens below, below one megaparsec of the, of the galaxy. So uh, uh, on large scales, this supports the lambda CDM uh, uh, prediction nicely. And, uh, but on small, small scales, there's a lot of things that yet to be uh, uh, understood. OK, so that's it. And uh, uh, we have, Gore is providing nice benchmark for all the groups, uh, both isolated cosmological simulations. And uh, hopefully, we'll, we can actually learn something about these feedback models uh, with the future surveys, like PFS. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Questions? Hey, Ken. Um, could you put up the slide again with the galaxy absorber cross correlations with finger? Yeah. Why no finger this got in the, Yeah. Why no finger got in the galaxy metals? This one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't understand that yet. Uh, good. Good question. And uh, I don't know why it shows up on this side and why we don't see it on this side. It's just maybe the resolution is not quite good. I think. Um, and also, this calculation was done only with a limited box. And uh, it's actually not utilizing the full path length of the wide redshift range. So maybe the sampling, signal sampling, was not quite good enough. Um, we're not sure yet. And uh, we have to look into this more, more carefully. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe also this uh, cor uh, uh, correlation was taken with certain lim limitation on, on the absorbers also. And, and, so this selection might also be affecting. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at this more carefully yeah, in the future. Thank you. 
Well, I, I looked at when I looked at your star formation rate uh, as function of time. Uh, the, uh, the the level eleven shows much more stars yes. integrate yeah. than ten. So I'm not sure you are so you kind of converged. Twelve might show even more stars. So you have an, maybe again an overcooling problem or something. Uh, did you think about that? Yes, it it may still have overcooling problem as well. Yes, that is true. So uh, that that of course depends on what kind of feedback models we take, right? And uh, right now we, we are doing this with this, uh, this type of uh, uh, parameters. And, uh, and of course, this does depend on the feedback models that we use. Um, so we may have to completely uh, revise our feedback models to, if you want to achieve more uh, stable uh, uh, convergence. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. This is all same, but same feedback, feedback, feedback uh, model. And, and just changing these parameters, that's all we've done. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Ken once again. Okay, thank you.